Aloha, everyone. Uh, mahalo for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for joining us in person or uh, over Zoom or those who are watching live on Olelo. I um, wanted to introduce our team here tonight. My name is Kurt Sui. I'm the Director for Community Affairs at Hawaiian Electric. And on behalf of Hawaiian Electric, welcome to our Resilient and Renewable Energy Community Workshop for the EVA MOKU uh, here broadcasting live from Leeward Community College. Um, to my left, your right, um, is uh, going to be our, our panel, who's going to be uh, sharing information with all of you tonight. Um, Alani Apio of Kamau LLC will be our meeting facilitator. Next, we'll have, uh, we have Ken Aramaki, who is Hawaiian Electric's Director of Transmission, Distribution, and Interconnection Planning. Mark Asano is Hawaiian Electric's Director of Integrated Grid Planning. Uh, Katie Wakter, who is with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and she's a geospatial science researcher three. Uh, joining us a little bit later in our question and answer portion will be Hawaiian Electric Senior Vice President of Planning and Technology, Colton Ching. And also wanted to thank our partners for at the Center for Resilient Neighborhoods. Um, they're, they're joining us in relation to our discussion about microgrids and making our communities more resilient. Um, and also a big mahalo to our partners at Olelo for helping us uh, put on tonight's meeting and for helping us with this new format that we're trying. So the goal of trying to do this was to provide more accessibility. Uh, we know all of you in community are very busy. Um, this meeting is being recorded in addition to being live broadcast. We're also trying to, in addition to offering an in-person venue, also providing a Zoom link for people to join us online. So trying to take advantage of uh, technology in the hybrid format. So mahalo to all of you for joining us in, in whatever format that you're available to. Just thank you for your time. So for those joining online, uh, you really haven't missed anything. A lot of the same information. We had an open house prior to opening tonight's meeting. Um, there, there was a, a, just an opportunity to engage with us in person. We have a lot of our subject matter engineers and technical experts uh, in person that we wanted to provide uh, information to people if they're interested. And um, for those who joined us in person, we did have some light uh, meals and refreshments. So mahalo for those who joined. At Hawaiian Electric, our communities count on us to keep the lights on. And it's also our responsibility to help stabilize energy costs by transitioning off of fossil fuel. That's part of the reason why we're here tonight, to talk about working with the community in our planning as we transition to renewable energy. We understand there are many concerns about electric bills and the cost of energy, and we're happy to have follow-up conversations on that topic. The primary reason why we're here tonight is we're focusing on our need to decarbonize our energy system and make it more resilient in light of climate change. Puerto Rico and Florida are recent examples of the reasons why we need to start planning now, being an island state in the middle of the Pacific. We are susceptible to and are vulnerable to climate change and the incidents that are caused by climate change. Tonight, we are hoping to introduce two separate but related planning concepts, and we are in need of your, the community's input, insight, and expertise. The first portion of our discussion will be on opportunities for what's known as microgrids. And so microgrids can serve and provide power to critical facilities connected to the electric grid, but it can also be sectioned off or islanded during a power outage to continue providing electricity through local energy resources. As uh, Ken will be sharing a little bit later in his presentation, there are different types of microgrids, but really the, the primary microgrid that we're gonna be talking about tonight is one that can power critical facilities in the community. And this is in direct support of disaster and emergency preparedness. We hope to get insight from the community about whether or not a concept of a microgrid should be considered for your community, and if so, what should be included. The second portion of our meeting tonight will be talking about energy planning at the macro level. We're 
we're looking at the entire island of Oahu and how we are going to decarbonize our energy system and the changes that are going to need to be made in order for us to achieve those renewable energy targets. But we, we're not able to do that alone. A lot of that important planning is going to require working alongside communities. We, we hope to, at, at that portion of the meeting, ask communities, how should we plan for our energy system to bring online more renewable energy generation sources to meet our needs while also achieving our resilience and decarbonization goals? So both of these concepts that we'll be talking about tonight, they all involve thorough planning and early, and so our goal is to start these conversations now at the, at the beginning of our planning process. And it also is going to all involve things like procurement um, or going through what's known as requests for proposals and eventually development. And so again, we are at the very early stages and we're hoping to include community in these early conversations and share the same planning information and analysis that our planners are looking at with community so that we can make informed decisions together. If we can go to the next slide, please, Ken. So this is just to share with you Traditionally, as a utility, we've really been technically driven. We have very smart engineers who come up with great technical solutions to make sure that we can provide safe and reliable energy to our customers. Um, but we realize that in order to, as we're moving forward in, in decarbonizing our grid, making it more resilient, we can't do it alone. It, it's also, we need to balance the priorities of the community along with the technical analysis. While we're, we're doing these studies, you know, trying to get all fossil fuel, looking for renewable energy technology and, and microgrids, we also have to ask ourselves, how, how are our communities experiencing these transitions and these changes? As we all know, and that we're, we're very much in the midst of, of renewable energy transitioning, there's significant impacts along the way that, that happen as a result of these changes. And so it's important to share this information up front and so that we can incorporate community input into the planning process. We're asking questions like how these new facilities and infrastructure are going to be impacting the people who live near them. And really, what are the priorities of the community as we make these changes? And so balancing that, the community's priorities, with the technical planning in order to make, it, make the energy system work to provide safe and reliable energy, that's what we're striving to do. And again, we cannot do this by ourselves, and we very much need the insight and the input from all of you as community. So just a big mahalo to all of you for joining us in this process. Um, again, we're in the early stages. Um, we're here to introduce a lot of information, but we're gonna be back, and we're gonna be continuing to have these conversations as we move forward. Um, specifically as it relates to making our system more resilient and also um, decarbonizing our energy system. So with that, I wanted to introduce for the first portion of our meeting, uh, Ken Aramaki, who's going to be sharing a little bit more about our planning for microgrids. What, what exactly are they and how can they help us make our energy system more resilient, specifically at the, mic we call it microgrid, so really at the, the community or the neighborhood level. You know, we're looking at making system improvements that can directly benefit communities. Ken? Thanks, Kurt. Aloha. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Ken Aramaki. I'm the Director of Transmission, Distribution, and Interconnection Planning at Hawaiian Electric. So uh, when we talk about, before we talk about microgrids, I want to explain why we think microgrids are important. Um, and so what this graphic is are each of these circles or bubbles are community lifelines. So a community lifeline is one where if any of these uh, pieces are impacted in any way, they uh, they impact our daily lives, or you know, they, um, and each of them are interconnected. But at the center of each of them is energy. So everything pretty much depends on energy. And uh, we know that you know at Hawaiian Electric, it's our job to make sure that you know we keep the lights on. And also because energy is so critical, we have to make sure that we look for opportunities to improve the resilience of energy. So. A little primer on microgrids. Uh, way back when, our electric grid was um, was designed and built uh, decades ago. Uh, it was built kind of a one-way power flow. 
So large generators were built. Uh, they were, they're, they're uh, transmitted at high voltages. They're stepped on at substations, and eventually they get to our customers. Um, over the years, uh, a, lot of, a lot more um, independent power producers were added to the system, or renewable generators, uh, you know, so PV, wind, um, and now recently you know, a, lot, a lot more energy storage is being added. And all of these are added at different parts of the grid as well. Um, essentially, they, they, they all support the system, um, just that the original system wasn't necessarily designed for these uh, different interconnections. Um, in addition, uh, a lot of customer-sided resources were added over the past you know, decade or so. Uh, so customer-sided resources like PV, uh, diesel generators, uh, and um, energy storage as well. And a lot of these were initially added at the customer level to help offset uh, customer bills. Um, but in addition to that, recently, um, functionality has also evolved with these systems. And customers are essentially uh, able to create microgrids themselves. So if you think of a house with PV and battery storage, and they have the ability to go off-grid uh, when the grid is out, that's essentially a microgrid. So at the smallest scale, that, that is a microgrid. Uh, a microgrid can also, I mean, it's kind of a broad uh, definition, but it can also uh, uh, be larger in scale. And so what we're here talk to talk about are hybrid microgrids. And hybrid microgrids consist of, um, is kind of like that larger circle where there's multiple customers, there's multiple resources uh, feeding into that microgrid. And so this microgrid consists of multiple customers using utility lines within it. Um, we have a program at Hawaiian Electric to, that enables this, uh, enables this kind of um, uh, archetype or <laughs> architecture. Um, and it is a complex type of system. Uh, so when we were developing this tariff, we knew that customers are gonna have a hard time even knowing if there's a, if there, if where they live is a good area to develop these microgrids. So around that time, um, we, there was this uh, program called the Energy Transitions Initiative Partnership Project. And that's ETIP for short, E-T-I-P-P. -P. So we're gonna call it ETIP uh, from now on. And what this does is this is a program that we applied for and we were selected for this first cohort. Um, essentially we get uh, national labs to help provide technical support uh, for this project. And this project was to develop a map that can show customers where there's potential opportunities to create these microgrids. And um, Katie's, I'm gonna bring up Katie from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, or NREL, and she's helping us uh, create the map. So she'll talk, she'll talk more about the map. Thanks everybody. Um, so, oh, thank you. Oh, yeah, that works. Um, yeah, mahalo. Thanks for having me out, everybody. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces and new faces. Um, my name is Katie Wachter, and I'm a geospatial data scientist at NREL, like Ken was explaining. Um, and I have been, I've been working with uh, some collaborators from Sandia National Laboratories, and I wanted to give them a shout out before I dive into um, the criteria that we're looking at for hybrid microgrid opportunities. So thanks to Dr. Matt Lave and Thad Haynes for helping with the power flow analysis. Um, like I said, I am a geographer, not an engineer, and I can't do this alone. Um, so without any further ado, um, like uh, what, what Ken was explaining, we're developing a map to help show customers where there might be good opportunities to develop hybrid microgrids. And so far, we've come up with three criteria that we think are useful for identifying these locations. So the first criterion, and probably the most obvious that we've come up with, is criticality. And so that's looking at where are the critical facilities, uh, loads, and services. So this includes places that are uh, critical in an emergency, such as emergency shelters, fire stations, um, emergency operation centers, first responders, places like that. Um, additionally, this includes medical facilities, so hospitals, um, outpatient facilities, surgical centers, uh, skilled care facilities like nursing homes, 
uh, in addition, dialysis centers and other places where ambulatory care is provided. Um, and finally, infrastructure. So this is critical infrastructure. Uh, that includes water sources, treatment plants, uh, internet exchange ports, harbors, uh, aircraft landing facilities, telecommunications, um, dams, pretty much anything that if something were to go wrong or power was disrupted there, there would be consequences uh, affecting life and limb. The second criterion that we've looked at so far is vulnerability, so looking at what parts of the grid currently and are projected to endure the longest or most frequent outages. So this includes natural hazards, uh, which includes flood or special flood areas, which is defined as 1% uh, flood zone or 100 year flood zones, as well as sea level rise, and that's projected through 2050 under uh, the low emission scenarios, so our CP 2.6, um, as well as landslide risk, tsunami evacuation zones, fire risk, and we added a, uh, a remoteness index to identify areas that are dependent on fewer uh, distribution and transmission lines as well as roads. And also we included 10 years of outages data so we could make sure that we're looking at you know, the average frequency of interruption, of interrupt, sorry, service interruptions for customers as well as the duration of those outages. And our last criterion is societal impact. So that's considering what other locations would be significantly impacted uh, and would impact communities if they lost power. So this includes places like residential care facilities, community homes, um, customers receiving assistance in one way or another, as well as schools, daycares, libraries, uh, emergency relief centers, uh, as well as disadvantaged communities. I know there's a lot of definitions of disadvantaged communities. The one that we're using follows uh, the Biden administration's Justice 40 definition that's been adopted by the Department of Energy that uses 36 different burden indices and demographic markers to identify disadvantaged communities. Next, please. All right, y'all ready to, for the test? So some of the criteria, um, criti criticality includes critical services directly affecting life and limb, particularly during an emergency. Um, vulnerability captures um, basically the infrastructure uh, within the distribution system. So where are the vulnerabilities uh, to natural hazards, um, to overall remoteness, if in case something does go wrong, how quickly can power be restored? and then overall grid reliability. And societal impact captures um, customers disproportionately affected by outages and ensures that at least equity and accessibility are considered in these hybrid microgrid opportunities. Next. Thanks. Okay, so this mapping exercise is being completed uh, across all of Oahu. It incorporates dozens of spatial data sets representing everything we've discussed so far. Um, and what we've ended up doing for this map, which was our first attempt at a hybrid microgrid opportunities map, was we built a model showing where grid connected customer energy resources like um, residential PV systems um, and electricity demand are balanced to find those hybrid microgrid locations. So those are, are areas where there's um, balanced you know, electricity load and supply so that if you were to add a hybrid microgrid, it would be a, a relatively lower level of lift. Um, but something that became clear to us pretty quickly is that this map is incomplete and it focuses on infrastructure and not the people. Um, and it's really the people that live here and how they're affected by service disruptions that is the crux of the issue with hybrid microgrids. So this is where you all come in. Um, we've included a lot of data in this analysis, but we have uh, some questions remaining, like are there criteria that you think are missing? Um, what places in your community should be included? 
Is there some place that you would go in emergency that's not captured in an official data set? Things like that. Um, so we'd love to have your perspective. And we have this map available online at hawaiipowered.com slash E-T-I-P-P for ETIP. Um, and there is a feedback form if you would like to um, share with us your opinion there, but also you can get a high-res uh, copy of this map. Oh, sorry, high, high resolution, thank you. Um, okay, so at the end of this mapping exercise, uh, the national labs will share community level maps for hybrid microgrid opportunities like this one in Haula. So the idea here is to show where these criteria and important community resources meet. So again, I encourage you all to visit hawaiipowered.com slash etip um, and check out uh, the Moku map for Eva, as well as uh, all of the different Mokus on Oahu. Um, and please share any suggestions for criteria, facilities we should include, important community places, important community groups or individuals that, that should be addressed or you know, considered in this analysis. So now I'd like to turn it over to Kurt. Oh, thank you, Katie. And so this is where we hope to hear from, from community in terms of uh, what was just shared, the concept of microgrids. Um, this is an opportunity to ask questions, but also to provide feedback. We're gonna be using this uh, virtual tool called Menti. So those who are here in person or those viewing live on Olelo or even on Zoom, um, you can log on to menti.com using this website here. For those um, with mobile devices, you can scan this QR code. Um, but ultimately, just visiting www.menti.com, entering the code 54982368 will allow you to all uh, input comments, questions that we can all here at the meeting and watching uh, on TV can see live. And so that can help to, that'll all be documented, but it'll help to also drive the conversation. Those who are in person and those joining uh, via Zoom, you can also ask questions uh, either virtually or in person. We'll take comments and questions in any format that you're willing to, to uh, provide them. Um, but essentially, we're, you know, we're, we're based on what was just shared by Ken and Katie, you know, we're hoping to ask the community what what types of you know what are we missing here when we're when we're looking at this option to potentially uh, provide or or install microgrids in communities to make communities more resilient. You know, what what types of facilities should be considered? You know, if there is a, a an emergency situation, a storm were to come in and there were to be a, a large power outage for an extended duration. Microgrids could potentially be a solution where, as Ken mentioned, you can sectionalize or what we call island off the electric grid in a certain uh, portion of the grid and um, provide power through, through some source. And so those are the types of concepts that you know we wanna hear from community. Katie mentioned we've done some homework on our part where we've looked at critical facilities, we looked at vulnerable areas, but really there's a lot of important information that the community has that we don't know in terms of gathering places, um, places where um, communities go in an emergency. Um, you know, where, where should where should power be prioritized in the event of an emergency? That's the type of concept we're looking at when it, when it, when it, as it relates to the concept known as microgrids. But um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alani who's gonna be facilitating this portion of the meeting. Good evening everybody. I'm gonna get this for the audience members. This is the last of this round of talks. And one of the things that I've come to realize, I was talking to one of the Hawaiian Electric staff members, is this, this work is difficult work because it's basically long-term planning, right? So I was like, give us your long-term planners, community. And that's, 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 a, that's a difficult lift. But it's super important because it takes years for these projects to come to fruition, sometimes a decade. And it's important for us as island community 
to work together. And we're not always going to get it right. You know, and if we look back a couple of years ago, there were challenges out in Kahuku with the wind farms because the process need, needed to be worked on. And uh, to everybody's credit, Public Utilities Commission, Hawaiian Electric, the legislature, we're addressing those challenges. And that challenge is coming here tonight in the context of community engagement and getting community level information. So there you go. So with that, I'm gonna open it up to the floor and a couple things that I wanna make sure that we start off the conversation with is if anybody has lingering questions about what a microgrid is, let's, let's get those out on the floor. And then the other thing is we're in the Eva Moku, this district, and what we're looking for, if you look up here, right, shopping centers, uh, grocery stores, schools, what we're looking for is the granular information. What shopping center? What schools? Uh, you know, key military bases. We got Pearl Harbor. We got Schofield up above on the plateau. That's the kind of information that we're looking for tonight, and it's an ongoing dialogue. So this is just the start of the process, and you're welcome to add in as we go along. But I noticed we had one pro uh, question here. I think we're going to need a lot of places to recharge our electric cars. And they've got to be well, widely distributed. Thank you. Really appreciate that. We had a comment the other night that was similar to that. And it was that by law, at some point, and I'm not sure when, but the state is supposed to translate all their vehicles into electric vehicles, which theoretically is a great idea. But if we're relying totally on our electricity for cars, that's an unintended consequence that we need to bring up. Right. So your point is well taken. Thank you. Others? Questions, concerns, ideas? <clears throat> Do we have anything on? Okay. I'm checking in with uh, Kanani to see if there are any questions coming in online. So I'm going to just <clears throat> go back to what is coming in through our mentee system and see if there's anything significant that we should be picking up and talking about. <clears throat> I, I was looking at the map. It's uh, for this district. It's all of Eva, Eva Beach area, all the way around to um, Lower Kalihi. So it's quite a big moku. Uh, so there's a lot of things to be, places to be considered, structures to be considered within that area. Eva Foodland, Safeway, Longs. We've got a lot coming in on the Menti. Any questions or ideas about where we should be in this moku? Things that we haven't looked at already or are not coming in yet. Well, I'll just add a little bit to the, the discussion to based on some of our previous meetings. You know, we. These are great inputs that, that are being provided here that are shown here on the screen. And again, this is things that we may not necessarily pick up on, on by doing a technical analysis. So you, know, you all know your communities best, and that's why we're really, we really appreciate the input and feedback that you're providing. Another you know, concept, you know, as Ken and Katie, they were talking about you know, sectionalizing or islanding off certain portions of the grid to create these microgrids. It's, um, it's something that, you know, we're also asking ourselves and as a community these questions on how should these microgrids be powered? Because right now, you know, Ken, is, Ken and his team and Katie, they're, they're looking at existing sources of generation that are on the system. Like for those who, customers who have rooftop solar plus batteries, that's being factored into this planning. But if there's not enough generation within that sectionalized microgrid, then, you know, what, what, are, what are the um, types of technologies that the community is interested in to provide that, that backup power? So in addition to rooftop systems and batteries, what else in the, in the community would be, would be a viable or open technology, a technology that the community would be open to, to potentially power these microgrids? You know? So that's just something that we don't, we don't have to answer that tonight, because again, this is long-term planning, as Alani said, but just something to think about, because that's what it 
it's going to take to bring these microgrids to fruition. It's asking and working with communities to identify the best locations um, by powering critical facilities in the event of emergencies. Um, but then, then what then is going to be powering those microgrids? Um, in the Ko'olaupoko region or Moku that we were just in on Tuesday, We've been engaging with them, and as, a, as an emergency uh, um, uh, generation for that side of the island, they're uh, particularly vulnerable because there's no power plants, there's no generation on the windward side. They, they're served by three transmission lines that cross the Ko'olau Mountains, and in the event of something like a severe storm, Though, if those transmission lines were to be damaged, um, we're doing everything we can to harden those lines. But you know, something like a stronger category storm, you know, that we don't know exactly what's going to happen. You know, that's something that we're having conversations with that community. And one of the ideas that came about from our our conversations was to have mo a, a, a mobile diesel generator that would be sited in the community that could potentially be transported to a location to power up these microgrids in a, or a version of a microgrid um, that could provide emergency power. So now, you know, we're, we're at this early stage. We're looking at the Evamo you know, just thinking about how that could potentially benefit communities in the Evamoku in the event of an emergency where transportation is impacted. You know, where, where would you go or where would you uh, identify in your community as a critical resource where you could go to, um, to meet, to gather, or to get access to things like food distribution or uh, communication, all those different. So those are the different concepts that we're looking at in this early stages of the microgrid planning. Um, money. Oh, thank you. Uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback on the Menti system, a lot of specificity to locations. So that's exactly the, the type of thing that we're, we're looking for. So for those of you who are uh, participating in that way, thank you so much. Questions? Ideas? Otherwise, we're actually going to go and jump into the second half of the presentation. We can come back to microgrids at any moment. So it's on the table, but going once, there we go, <laughs> okay, here you go. Thank you. Um, for all of these suggestions coming in from the community, how would you folks look at prioritizing which ones are being suggested? Great question, and I'm gonna turn that back to the specialists. Thank you for that. Test, test, okay, great. Um, that is an excellent question, and one of the the things we were trying to get at with these meetings was what what facilities, what criteria are more important to the community? Because as it stands now, we're weighting everything the same. And obviously, like not everything is going to be as important um, in the event of an outage or a real emergency. So I mean, at this point, I'm thinking, and I'm happy to take suggestions or ideas, that um, the frequency of responses uh, around certain themes like like food centers or distribution centers, schools, um, that information indicates to me a relative importance per community or at least per MOKU. Um, so I'm I'm planning on using that, but I'm totally open to suggestions. So what I get out of that, Katie, is that it's still a work in progress how we're going to get those answers. Yeah, and it also comes down to economics, right? We can't put a uh, microgrid any, everywhere. So what is the, you know, the, the criteria that we're going to use? And, and the point at this point is we need to get the community involved because it's ultimately the community as a collective is going to point out where the highest need is. I wanted to go to a question um, that came in through Menti that I thought was really interesting and should be addressed. And that is, can Waiau power plant be repurposed into a microgrid. Yeah, thanks, Alani. That that's an uh, that's an excellent question. So, Wyo Power Plant is one of our uh, major centralized power plants that serve the island. So, in the event of say uh, an island-wide blackout, um, you know it does have some black start capability there. And when we're in the process of uh, trying to restore power, we would use Wyo Wyo Power Plant to help. Um, restore power to essentially the greater grid. Um, so, so, yeah. 
two questions. One, what, uh, for those of us who don't know, what is a black start? And getting back to the answering it, can YL power plant be repurposed into a microgrid? What I hear you saying is not really because it's, it's, it's serving a greater purpose. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, so, yeah, so to answer the question, no, um, we wouldn't use YL power plant to island uh, or microgrid. Um, we would use it as a, uh, the power plant. Um, so black start means if, if the island went out, uh, the, the whole island went out, uh, power outage, an island-wide power outage, um, while power plant would be used to help bring the power back to the entire island. Um, and that would be used to then uh, start to bring back, you know, sections of the island as we restore power. So essentially what you're saying, if to my layperson's mind, is it's basically a macro grid creator. Like yes. It's serving at the macro grid level. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, Kurt, did you see anything that you guys wanted to pull up and talk about, or should we go into the next side? No more? Okay. You want to go into the next? Okay. Well, so thanks, everybody. This is great feedback. And again, this is not the end of the conversation. As Alani said, it's just the beginning. And so, again, a lot of these concepts are something that, you know, if you know others in your neighborhood or community or others that are active and who would be interested in providing input for something like this in your particular community, you know, we hope to work more closely with the neighborhood boards. But also, that's the reason why we're so thankful to be working with the partners at uh, Center for Resilient Neighborhoods, also known as Serene. They're doing grassroots level work to partner with communities at the neighborhood level to identify locations for what's known as resili resilience hubs in communities. And so this has been lessons learned from many disaster incidents that have happened all over the globe and how these critical facilities that have regular purposes on blue sky days that serve communities but are focused upon and invested in to be hardened, to potentially have access to emergency power by having its own potential system, potentially things like um, growing, uh, you know, to, to providing a food source, refrigeration, um, and, and hardened to be a, a community gathering place. Because the last thing that in, in the event of emergency, you know, things like hospitals may have generators and they may activate to service medical needs, but the last thing you want in an emergency is lots of people going to the hospital for services. And so that's the purpose of these resilience hubs is their locations and, and identified facilities in communities that are known to be gathering places that can service this very critical need in the event of an emergency. And that's the important work that are being done with by our partners at Serene. And that kind of dovetails into our conversations about microgrids because if we, in addition to having its own power, you know, these resilience hubs could make good candidates for being connected to microgrids. If we were able to identify critical facilities, that community hub would definitely be would qualify as a uh, as a critical facility that we would look at in terms of how could we potentially support that facility in addition to some of the others that the community is raising and some of the critical um, services that Katie and her team has been doing as part of this analysis. So that's kind of how it all fits together in the big picture. You know, uh, uh, Serena is working with the Office of Climate Change, Sustainability and Resiliency. There's also statewide planning happening at the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. So all, all of this is interrelated. And so again, uh, ongoing discussion and a very important one in terms of our planning um, as an island state. So I just wanted to mention that and to thank uh, Serene, but also to thank all of you for spending your time to provide this input because it is going to really help us build a foundation for these conversations as we move forward and we start these, these planning processes, especially in the area of resilience. So um, just wanted to, to mention that as we transition to this next portion of the meeting, you know, a lot of the discussion that we just talked about was talking about microgrids. And now we're going to be talking about 
the macro grid, as Alani said. And, and this is now in addition to looking at things at the neighborhood level, looking at things island wide. You know, we have very ambitious goals as a state to reach 100% renewable energy by 2045. And as I mentioned earlier, that transition is going to require a lot of change that impacts communities. And that planning is already well underway, but we, again, cannot do this alone. There's a lot of, of elements that you know, we're looking at that we want to share with communities along the way. Um, not right before we have to construct something or before a project is identified. When we're doing these studies and these engineering designs and analysis, we're looking at the resource potential or so where we're like where on the island of Oahu and, and the other territories we serve, where are there opportunities for renewable energy? Because as I mentioned earlier, we're also looking at balancing affordability and cost in this as well. There are existing renewable technologies that are out there, but currently uh, solar energy and wind energy are the most affordable at this point in time. And that, that could change as we move forward. Other, other technologies may also become more, um, more, more, um, re more um, feasible for us you know, in terms of our planning, because we are looking at cost as we're looking at these renewable energy projects as well. So the reason that we're showing this screen here, Hawaii Powered, is we've mentioned these links, these resource links. That's where you know we hope that you'll visit us online, uh, www.hawaiipowered.com. We've tried to take a lot of the technical analysis that can be very um, engineering driven, but making it more user friendly, and so that it can be something that community members can use to participate in the energy planning process. So Mark. Asano, our Director for Integrated Grid Planning, is going to be sharing a little bit more about this analysis that was done recently to look at the, the feasibility or resource availability potential for solar energy and wind energy on the island of Oahu. And so there's a lot of considerations that were built in here, and it's far from a perfect study or an analysis, but it just looks at, you know, we had to take into a lot of considerations. We had to rule out areas that were pristine agricultural lands. We had to rule out areas that are, are sloped areas. We had to rule out conservation land. And, you know, all of those things kind of factored into these plannings. But the reason we wanted to share this information with you so that we're looking at the same thing. And also it helps to level the playing field because this is the same information that developers are looking at when they're looking at building renewable energy projects. So by allowing communities to weigh in early on, on the same technical analysis that's being done island-wide, you know, our hope is that we can capture and document community feedback that can also inform our renewable energy procurements. When we go out and we, we seek low-cost bids for renewable energy projects, we can share the input that you as community have you based on your insight and your awareness of your neighborhoods and your areas and share that up front um, and, and document that rather than having to go through a formal PUC process we want to make available to you uh, through this website and through any any means of your willingness to provide your insight um, we will document that for you and we'll file that as part of our long-range planning process known as integrated grid planning so that's just in essence what Hawaii powered is it's it's an attempt at trying to translate a lot of the technical information that our engineers are looking at and allowing communities to look at it and to weigh in, to participate, and work using that information as part of our planning. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, Mark Osano, and he's going to share a little bit more about this analysis uh, that was done on renewable uh, wind and solar energy known as renewable energy zones. Thank you, Kurt. Let's see. And uh, welcome everyone, good evening. Uh, my name's Mark Asano and I lead the company's uh, long range planning efforts. So I just want to start off tonight, you know, one of the, the main reasons that we're here tonight is uh, it's about clim climate change. And so all of the plans that we've been talking about tonight um, is really uh, to combat climate change. And recently the legislature has expressed that concern um, by passing a a law to reduce carbon emissions across the state uh, by 50% uh, by 2030, and then uh, by 2045 to be a state that is net zero carbon emissions. So this is something that we are focused on uh, in helping the state meet, 
meet its target. Um, and a lot of it, and a means to get there, is to be able to bring on more renewable energy onto the system and reduce our fossil fuel usage. So when we think about our long-term planning, there's a, a number of considerations that we take into account. Uh, one of them being time. So as we, as we think about the timeline to 2030, uh, that's just eight years away to reduce our carbon emissions uh, by 50%. So it's gonna take a lot of urgent action on everyone's part to be able to accomplish that goal. Uh, in terms of affordability, we see uh, new renewable projects such as solar and battery projects as a means to stabilize customer bills, uh, to insulate ourselves from uh, the volatile fossil fuel prices. Um, and when we take, talk about land use, uh, we know that solar energy takes a lot of land. So uh, we realize that there's a lot of competing priorities for land use and, and land is limited, especially on the island of Oahu. Uh, you know, there's a lot of competing priorities uh, such as affordable housing, uh, food sustain sustainability, and agriculture. Uh, so that is something we're really cognizant about and that's why we are working with landowners as well as communities to to get their input as we plan our long-term future. Um, energy sources, as, as Kurt talked about, right now at, with the state of renewable technologies, wind and solar are the, the most cost-effective technologies as we see it today. That's not to say by 2045 there won't be other uh, technologies available to us that may take up less land, um, but eventually they'll, um, you know, cost declines may make those commercially viable. And then finally, reliability and resilience. You know, as the electric company, we do take our responsibility seriously to be able to ensure that we can maintain a reliable system and ensure that we can make it more resilient as we weather uh, increasing amount of storms and sea level rise and, and things of that nature. So as, as, uh, as we look at our transition to reducing our carbon emissions. Um, on this slide here, you can see a number of projects that we have in progress. So uh, in the renewable in development col uh, column there, we have a number of solar and battery energy storage projects that are currently um, have been approved by the Public Utilities Commission and are in the process of being built and going through the permitting process. Uh, so by in the next uh, year or two, we expect to have uh, quite a number of renewable projects online and providing renewable energy to our grids. Sorry. Okay. And another aspect of our plans going forward is uh, rooftop solar. So we we've done a study to examine the technical potential of rooftop solar on the island. Um, that is certainly part of our plans. We, we know that we can't reach a 100% renewable energy with just rooftop solar alone. Um, so we do, we do see value in having both rooftop solar as well as uh, the larger scale solar projects. And so that, that'll certainly be part of what we're looking to acquire going forward. So one of the, one of the analyses that we conducted in order to determine how we will reach 100% uh, renewable energy is this renewable energy zones analysis. So in this analysis, we identified, we looked at all of the land on the island of Oahu, uh, and then we excluded things like land that were in tsunami zones, flood zones. Uh, we also excluded land that were um, important agricultural land, land with high soil quality that could be used for farming um, and, and things of that nature. And so what, what we're left with is you see parcels of land on this map shaded in green. And so this represents the uh, technical potential where solar and wind can be developed. But now what we're looking for is input from communities as to where on Oahu would be good places to develop future projects because we know we need more uh, solar in order to reach our renewable energy goals and reduce our fossil fuel usage. But also what we're looking for 
in, in feedback from communities is areas on the island where we should be more cautious, where there may be cultural sensitivities, um, things that we may, places we may want to avoid, um, the, avoid development of renewable energy projects in the future. Um, so that's, that's sort of the goal and the next step we see in, in this long-term planning process. And one way, um, yeah, so um, right now we'll kind of open it up for discussion and questions um, as I, I know I went through a lot of uh, uh, points there. Thanks, Mark. So just a reminder for everybody who is uh, online, in person, or watching live, you know, um, you can go on to the Menti website again. And so same, same code, so www.menti.com, code is 54982368. And this is just a prompting question, but it's really an opportunity to ask questions, share comments, you know. As Mark shared the, the concept of this renewable energy zones analysis, you know, we're, we're wanting to hear from community. What, what are some important factors that should be considered in the siting of renewable energy on the island of Oahu? And, you know, we really want to hear from the Evamoku because, you know, we understand that the Evamoku is currently siting already renewable energy projects. And so, you know, going forward, you know, what would they, what would you all like to see with respect to your communities and, and how we plan going forward? And I'm going to turn it over to Alani. Thank you. Uh, couple things it's so this is the macro scale discussion now rather than the micro scale so you know we've been this is the last of our six meetings around the island and so just want to make sure you folks know although you may be living in and working in this moku your comments need not be limited to just this moku so we're talking about macro scale um, you know, we've had people in YNI when we went out there said, thank you very much, we've had enough solar, perhaps other people should bear that burden. And, and you know, that's, that's their comment and their right to give that, that kind of feedback. But that's also what we're looking for from you folks. Uh, we all live on this small island together and we have to figure out a way going forward where we can do these projects uh, in a way that is equitable and just to everybody. So I, I saw you had a question. Have we stopped talking about wind power, particularly offshore? Good question. We've had that at a couple meetings. Who would like to answer that? Yeah, in, in terms of uh, offshore wind development, uh, the way we run our um, processes to acquire renewable projects are, is we issue requests for proposals where we allow uh, developers to propose uh, different projects. Uh, they could be solar, they could be land-based wind, it could include offshore wind. We know there are developers out there currently talking to certain communities about potentially developing offshore wind projects. Um, so we as a company have not taken any technologies off the table, but we, um, you know, along with developers are working with communities to see which technologies would be uh, acceptable in certain communities. I have a clarifying question. Is it, is it my understanding as a layperson that it's actually, when you folks put out those proposals, you're not allowed to limit the, like what opportunities come in vis-a-vis -vis the Public Utilities uh, Commission is really the entity that sets those parameters, is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's okay. correct. And so, so you know, to, to answer your question, Hawaiian Electric, am, am I also correct? I, I thought I heard that there's actually no wind proposals, offshore wind, on the table currently. Yeah, currently the, the company is not, uh, you know, for example, negotiating any contracts for, for offshore wind currently. And that's why actually, sir, this is, these kind of meetings are important. So, for example, when we were out in the Waialua area, they have told us multiple times that for multiple reasons, they don't want to see a wind farm off Ka'ena Point. And they have that absolute right to give us that feedback, and that's why we're doing it. And ultimately, that will go into the report that is, is generated out of all of this work, 
and then given to developers so that people, developers will know, you know, at least in part, what community sen sentiment is right up front. Other questions, other comments? Again, you don't, we don't need to be limited to just the Evamoku as far as where you guys are thinking about. Is there anything, Kanani, on the, okay. Uh, there's actually a good question I see up here that maybe um, one of our experts can take on. And it says, how can nearby residents see direct benefits from energy projects? Thank you, Olani, an excellent question. And this is actually speaking to the reason why we're here tonight. We actually have had excellent input and helpful input from the community to help us with this in this regard. As Alani mentioned, you know, we've been working a lot with the West Oahu community because of the, the impacts of, and, and, and what they've shared with us as an energy burden with respect to projects that get cited in their community. And so it, as part of their feedback to us and our engagement with them and our dialogue, they were able to convene a lot of leaders within the community, nonprofit organizations, neighborhood boards, uh, come together and align in their interest to submit a letter to the Public Utilities Commission that helped to inform uh, Hawaiian Electric's request for proposals or procurement processes. And so that was done when we were seeking input on uh, what was known as community-based renewable energy or shared solar. And so as a result of that input, that essentially CBRE or shared solar is rooftop solar without a roof. So essentially it's like a solar project. It can be on the garage tops like here at, at LCC. It can be a, a, a PV farm itself, but it allows users to subscribe uh, to portions of the project so that they can achieve the same benefits as customers with rooftops. So that's a program that we are currently seeking um, proposals on currently. But the feedback we got from the community is that if the project is going to be cited in their community, then why can't they have first access to subscribe to those projects? And that was an excellent suggestion and question that got filed to the PUC. Um, in addition to a lot of the concerns that Alani mentioned, they put all of their thoughts and their feedback in writing and submitted it to the PUC. And a lot of what they had asked for or, or um, proposed in, in their um, recommendation letter made it into the request for proposals. And it's not just that one single procurement. It's all procurements going forward. And so that's really the value and the weight that communities can have as part of this process. So that's just one example. So like for that, those shared solar project developments, communities who are, are closest to the projects will have the opportunity to subscribe to, the, to that project before other part portions of the island. So that one, that's one big benefit. They also asked about lo hiring local, workforce development, all those opportunities. So those are now incentivized as part of the, the procurement process. And even on a going forward basis, we have what's known as our stage three request for proposals. There's different procurements happening for Hawaii Island, uh, for, uh, for Maui, as well as for Oahu. Um, but because of that same input, you know, on a going forward basis, um, and, and thanks to the support of the PUC and a, lo a lot of the other collaborating agencies, requests f the, the procurements for that next stage of, of RFPs or requests for proposals are going to, for the first time, require community benefits for those projects. And so those are very specific in that there's going to be a minimum dollar amount associated to the size of the project. So the larger the project, the larger the amount of community benefits. But there's very direct language in our RFPs or requests for proposals that require developers to work with communities to identify and document community needs and make sure that those community benefits or that funding goes towards supporting those needs. And so that's something that is going to be a required documented process that will be for all renewable projects as part of what's known as our stage three uh, procurements going forward. So just, a, and there's actually a lot more that we can share, but I just wanted to share those examples of how, how powerful it can be when communities align and, and share their input um, as part of this process and how it helps to improve our procurement process going forward. Thank you, Kurt. 
uh, with that, that's a lot of information. Questions, further questions, further concerns. I did want to affirm, like you folks being here and being part of the process, when these projects get to fruition, and we're several years away from them, but for example, the community benefits part, you folks as community members should have, will have the opportunity, and I encourage you to take it, to be a part of those dialogue process, uh, processes for where developers are going to actually put those community benefit dollars within your folks' communities. It's still gonna come down to you folks being involved and helping to decide where these resources are going. So, other questions, comments, concerns? Sure. Um, do you folks foresee any kind of mandates for requiring solar on state and county facilities? And then, a more specific question, um, I was talking to a branch manager at the Molokai Public Library, and she was wondering how uh, a building, like a library, would go through that process to get solar on their building. Great questions, thank you. Who would like to take those on? Yeah, so in, in the first question um, about state and county uh, requirements, I believe there has been some bills contemplating, contemplated at the county level uh, to require um, uh, such mandates to you know, put solar on um, you know, state and county buildings. Uh, there's also others like the University of Hawaii system that has a net zero goal, and so we've been working with uh, the, the UH uh, to put solar at their campuses around the, the state. Um, your second question, uh, the Molokai question, typically uh, customers such as you know, Molokai, uh, the library there, um, they would work with a solar contractor to be able to enroll in one of the company's programs. So we, Hawaiian Electric does have a number of solar programs that customers can enroll in, uh, but uh, the way that's usually done is a customer will work with a contractor and ins solar installer to be able to put solar on their rooftop. Just to be clear on his first question, am I hearing you right that whether, the, whether there's a mandate for the use of city and state lands to put as much solar or renewables on their properties is what you were asking, right? Am, am I hearing you right in that is that that's actually a legislative purview. It's not something that Hawaiian Electric can require. Yes, that's correct. Okay. But we, we will work with those agencies once yep, that's yeah. implemented. So again, yeah. it's, it's community involvement and getting you know, the legislators to see if they can craft bills that would be you know, helpful for us to get there. Questions, concerns, comments? Do we have, we, okay, checking on the mentee. Can, uh, this is going back to microgrids, if you don't mind, but I think this is a good question. Can the site selection be part of the microgrid design and community resiliency? Can the site selection, I, th I don't know whether they're talking about um, the macro that we're talking about or the micro. Uh, does yes. anybody? Uh, I'll interpret this to mean, can the site selection for what we're talking about in the renewable energy zones, the larger, utility scale grids, can they be part of the microgrid design and community resiliency? Um, I think it's similar to that YL question where what we're seeking uh, through the renewable energy zones projects are larger utility scale projects that provide uh, energy at that macro level um, and you know power the entire system and can be used throughout the system. Um, yeah, and so, um, whether they're part of a microgrid design and community re resiliency, there could be elements that are included in that design that are possible that can provide some resiliency benefit. Um, but you know, all of that are additional kind of layers of uh, complexity and cost. Thank you, thanks Ken. There's uh, one question that came through that I'd love for, uh, probably Kurt is probably the best, and that is what kind of community benefits are offered or available? That's a good question. And really, as part of the way that 
the, the uh, RFP is uh, request for proposals. Um, the stage three one that I mentioned are currently proposed is there really isn't any specific limitations to it. It really is up to the communities to define number one, their needs, and then what types of benefits then go towards addressing those needs. So we didn't want to be prescriptive uh, to developers and when they're engaging and they're having these conversations with you all as community, we really want to, to the earlier point that somebody raised uh, in, in their comment of working and engaging meaningfully with communities to understand what those needs are and to make sure that the, whatever project is being proposed is, is helping to address those needs in the community. So again, Nothing, the short answer is there's nothing specific. It doesn't have to be limited to, to anything like, for example, you know, when, when Hawaiian Electric worked with the West Oahu community to, um, to uh, propose the Campbell Industrial Power Plant in the early 2000s, we, we spent a lot of time working with communities to understand their needs. And they came up with proposals that we would have never thought of on our own. You know, one of the one of the really important, significant concepts was they realized that the power plant, Kahi power plant, and and if uh, Campbell Industrial Power Plant, were they, they use um, portable water, were connected to the portable water system. So they asked, would we be willing to connect to the the Honolulu Uli City and County of Honolulu wastewater treatment plant to use recycled water? And so that was proposed by the community, documented and filed with the Public Utilities Commission, and that got approved. Um, in addition to, they wanted to have a fish quality monitoring program, which is still in service to this day, as well as air quality monitoring. So it's things like that that are important to communities that can be proposed, and, and working with developers, working with community, identifying what's the best fit for that particular community and, and adjacent communities. That's really going to be an important part of the dialogue that Alani mentioned that, again, none of us can do this together. We, we need to work with communities to identify these potential solutions to make these projects help benefit communities directly. Uh, thanks, Kurt. One clarif clarifying comment, and that is whatever the community benefits are proposed, whatever they are, they still, the, the final arbiter will be the PUC, right? Whether that is, or uh, let me ask the question, who will be the final arbiter of what, what gets approved in these uh, community benefit process? So this one's a little bit different, Alani, because usually when, for, like, for these uh, current proposals that are being proposed by developers, they're going to be required to uh, give back a minimum dollar amount. They can exceed the minimum, and right now that's set at $3,000 per megawatt per year. So this is going to be that amount over the course of a 20-plus year contract known as a power purchase agreement. But as part of that, the developer in working with communities, they're going to have to document their dialogue with community and to make that publicly available so that we can, you know, they can be held accountable to those conversations to identify. So that doesn't necessarily have to be approved by the Public Utilities Commission in the way that Hawaiian Electrics did when we were proposing to build Campbell Industrial Power Plant. This one would be the dollar amount, but we, we are going to help to oversee that process when, when they identify this or they provide this report of their working with the community. We're going to make sure that it's directly tying to a community's needs. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Just one last question. How small can a microgrid be to catch Hawaiian electric's interest? I mean, is that one megawatt, 10 megawatt? Thank you. How small can a microgrid be to catch my, uh, Hawaiian electric's interest? Um, interesting question. So, um, <laughs> So microgrids can be as small as one house, uh, as I explained, can be uh, through our hybrid microgrid program, it can be as large as three megawatts. Um, it can potentially be larger. We're not necessarily seeking uh, microgrids for these larger procurements. These larger procurements provide uh, energy at the that macro level. So we're seeking larger megawatts, not necessarily needed to have a uh, microgrid functionality. That did, that, did that get that answered? Okay, thank you. 
Sure. Coming over. Uh, what, what's the total uh, consumption or what's the, what's the load on the current uh, Hawaiian Electric uh, system? Like, I, I, guess, I know it's probably like in the gigawatts, but I, I don't know at the moment. And how, and I know we're, yeah, we're trying to transition 100% renewable, right? How close are we? And how, like, how much percentages per year we're we gonna have to put on Got as, it. as it gets hotter? Got it, thank you. We had that on the first night as well. So I know somebody has the answer for that. Now he does. Uh, let me think. Okay, so the, the peak load of Oahu is about 1,200 megawatts. Um, uh, right now, uh, our, our RP renewable, po renewable portfolio standard is about 34%. Is that make these better? Yeah, so the, uh, the current renewable energy on the island... Um, of Oahu, well, I, I should say, through, I'll, I'll answer it based on, because we serve like multiple islands. Um, uh, we're, we're currently at 38% as of 2021. The, the law was just recently changed and the formula is gonna change a bit so that that, that number is gonna change um, at the end of this year. Uh, but so we still have a ways to go. Um, and, and so that's part of, this effort now is to figure out how we're gonna get that next tranche of solar onto the grid to help um, make a bigger uh, uh, dent in that uh, getting to 100%. Mark, uh, for clarifying f uh, for the gentleman, when you said 38%, are you talking about system-wide all three counties? Yeah, that's correct. Do we know what percentage of renewables are available, f are being used for the island of Oahu. Yeah, I should know this. I, I think it, <laughs> let me get back to you. I'll, okay. I'll think okay. about that. <laughs> how much, so the question, if I heard you right, is how much cheaper, which uh, precludes that it will be cheaper, right? right? Um, what is the sense of cost? So we got Colton coming up, and he's going to answer at least one yeah, of the questions. So, so just to be clear, I'm older than Mark, but my memory is better than his. So um, based upon the old formula that we're transitioning off of, uh, for 2021, here on the island of Oahu, we're just over 30% uh, RPS. Uh, the neighbor islands are leading, leading the state, right? So on Maui, we were in the 40s, high 40s. And on the Big Island, we were just about 60% RPS. <clears throat> Again, that's based upon the RPS law formula that was changed, pr the prior formula that was just changed this past July. And under the new formula, in general, the numbers are going to be a little bit lower. So yeah. who wants to take on his follow-up question, which is, as we get to full renewable <laughs> energy, what are we looking at as consumers in what we're gonna play. Can that even be answered at this point? Yeah, I think your question was around the economics, right? The, so, um, like, like so many things in life, uh, as we shift from the use of one resource, fossil fuels, over to uh, a better solution, a different resource, you're gonna start off by picking the most cost-effective resources you can as you're starting that transition. So, and that's why we have a lot of wind initially, why today we have a lot of solar that's been added, both grid scale larger systems as well as smaller systems. Um, and that's been, at some times, those, the price of those renewables have been much lower than the cost of fossil fuel generation. At other times, it's actually been a little bit more expensive than fossil fuels at the time. But what we were doing the transition for was one, environmental, uh, but two, to have more certainty of what the cost or price of electricity will be or to generate electricity will be, right? So in times like today where oil prices are much higher than what they were a year ago, um, the renewables that we've purchased that might have been a little bit more expensive than the price of oil five years ago are very cost effective today. As we go into the future and we add more renewables, we're going to start exhausting the lower cost choices for renewable energy. And we're going to need to select 
higher cost renewables as time goes by. Now we, we're working really hard to make sure those renewables can be as low as cost as possible, doing things like the renewable energy zone work so we can plan ahead and more efficiently build the infrastructure to add more renewables is one way to do it. The other is, I think the gentleman brought up the question about offshore wind, using and looking at technologies that we're not using today and looking and being open to the new ones in the future. Uh, geothermal here in Oahu, you know, different kinds of, of new technologies as well as solar and wind becoming more efficient as they develop and become more advanced. Those are things I think that can help us. But ultimately, as we move forward, at least based upon all of the past analyses that we've done, um, as we add more renewable energy on our system, the, the cost of those renewables will go up. Now, that doesn't mean that our costs will automatically go up because ultimately it's going to be in comparison to the price of oil. And there's one big lesson for us in the last year is that almost no one can predict right, what oil prices will be or fossil fuel prices will be. So if I hear you, Colton, what do you, what do your, the response to that is, you can't say right now that it's actually going to be lower right. in the future, right. but it, it will be solid. It's that stability and predictability that, that Ken and Mark talked about at the beginning is, or and Kurt talked about actually in the beginning, is really what's, uh, I think, one of the key benefits of moving away from fossil fuels to renewable energy. These renewable projects that Mark talked about you know, on that chart that shows all of the projects that are underway. These projects, um, we're partnering with third parties, independent power producers. We're entering into contracts that are 20, 25 years in duration, and the price is fixed. No one can buy oil today for the next 25 years on a fixed price, right? So we know what, en the, what the price of the energy from these resources is going to be today and for the next 20 years. That, that certainty and that stability in pricing will be very, very valuable to our customers. I know that isn't exactly what you're hoping to hear, but is that, did that answer the question? Thank you. Did you, I'm sorry, did you have one? Oh, sorry. There was, uh, did anybody have any questions or thoughts? Because I saw a good question that came through on here. Um, where is it? Oh, how can, how can private landowners, shopping centers, and big parking lots be incentivized to get solar and potentially CBRE? Does somebody want to take a shot at that one? Yeah, so for uh, CBRE, that's our community-based renewable energy program. We, we had uh, or we have ongoing procurements to uh, seek projects for that. Uh, to fulfill that program. Uh, within the RFP, normally what would take place is a landowner or a shopping center, for example, would work with a developer to develop a project on their land, and then they would submit a proposal to us. So that's normally the process for how that would go. And so we recently had RFPs open uh, for that program, um, and we're currently in the process of evaluating uh, the proposals that we received. Thank you, Mark. Sure, sure. Sorry, so um, I'm not sure if the question actually came from a landowner, um, but my one suggestion uh, for landowners, you know, people who fit into this category of this question, um, we, we do regular requests for information, or RFI, where we put out to landowners and say, hey, let us know if you're interested in leasing or selling your property, renting your property out for a developer, like Mark talked about, to develop a renewable energy project. Uh, by responding to the RFI, it makes that information, right? So basically raising your hand, it makes that information available to developers and it improves the, your, your chances, your ability of connecting with the developer and having a project get developed there. So for any landowners uh, out there, uh, property owners, um, 
you know, be responsive to the RFIs, and I think that'll help. Thank you for that. There's a couple more up there. I'm checking the room, uh, not seeing any. There's, there's two questions that I thought we should address. One is, are there any shared solar projects available today for communities in the Evamoku? And I believe they're talking about CBRE is shared. Okay, are there any that you know of? Not right now, Olani, but absolutely, that would be something we would like to actively promote and offer to the community when available. And so there, there is right now, uh, very soon, going to be an announcement on the uh, proposers for what was known as low and moderate income um, shared solar projects. So that's going to be first. And then following that up, we're going to have selections for the shared solar request for proposals that was issued uh, earlier this year. So just to clarify, I'm going to try to clarify for that person who asked the question. It isn't actually in, if I hear you correctly, when you put out the request for proposals, it's not that you can say, we need one in this district, we need one in that district. It really is just open and, and developers respond. So there's no way to guarantee, for example, that the Evamoku would get any. It's, it's, it's really up to the, the, the developers who are responding. Is that correct? Yes, and the landowners, as Colton mentioned, it's, it's that pairing of a willing landowner and a willing developer agreeing that they would like to develop a project together, and that's when they uh, submit a proposal as part of these requests for proposals. Got it. Thank you. Uh, another follow-up that is, uh, I see up there is, how can HECO involve more community members in these kinds of discussions besides these kind of meetings? I can take that one too, Alani. It's really, um, as Alani said, starting of this conversation. We are absolutely willing to uh, have these conversations with community in their space or whoever is willing to have us. Um, a little bit later, we're going to be sharing with you a resource tool that we just created where it's, it's a map of Oahu that is a, a, where you can, as a community member or as a group, uh, place or drop pins on the island to provide your uh, direct feedback on where there are opportunities for maybe a renewable energy project or areas that should potentially, as, as uh, Mark mentioned, be, be avoided for whatever reasons. But as Alani said, you know, in addition to providing that feedback, we want to hear and, um, from you on why, why that is that you feel that way or communities have that understanding so that we can document that and capture that feedback and, and your voice and use that as part of our documentation and planning process. So again, this is very far from the, the end of the conversation. It's the beginning. Um, so to the extent, as Alani mentioned, community members are willing to participate in long-range planning. We're absolutely excited to have those conversations with you. Not, not everyone is, but you know, if, if, if you are interested in providing that feedback, we would, de would deeply appreciate um, the, the documented feedback from, from community. Thank you. Coming out. Just quickly wanted to ask where you're promoting these types of meetings and community discussions. Got it. Thank you. Where, Kurt, and Kurt's responsible for that, where is this being promoted and how, the, these meetings? So for this, for these particular series of meetings, we reached out to neighborhood boards. We worked with our partners at the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Um, we, we, um, we ran um, stories in the Star Advertiser, Pacific Business News. Um, we tried to leverage uh, all of the area, um, the island elected officials to try and share information. And, and we hope that we can continue to, to do that and to leverage those channels. But again, a lot of the, the success in getting um, community members to come out is through word of mouth. And so if we can get help um, you know, in your respective circles, those of you watching, if you could share this, if you are on the neighborhood board or if you're part of a community organization uh, that you would like to introduce this information to and, and we'll come out and, and talk story with you and compile your feedback, that, that's how we are going to get a better sense of how communities feel and their priorities and their needs as part of these, these important planning initiatives. Did that get it? Did you have any recommendations about how we can get better the word out. Um, I did hear about it from word of mouth, but I know when I, it got closer to the date and I was looking for more information, it wasn't really easy to find, so I just wasn't sure if you would have a bigger turnout if it was promoted more. Thank you. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we're, we're trying to leverage our social media channels as well, but we understand too that um, a lot of that is through re-forwarding or reposting, retweeting, those types of things too. So to the extent that you know your circles or, or groups can help us, we deeply appreciate it. So we're coming, we're coming close to our uh, scheduled finish time. Wanted to double check if there are any other questions, comments, or concerns from the audience. What do you think, Kurt? Were there any other questions? If Ken, you could scroll up a little bit. Maybe we could take a, a one or two more from the, from the mentee. Oh, I saw one, yeah, this one I wanted to put to you guys. Uh, it's on the screen, it's on the left side. Can we prioritize selecting projects that are being developed by local organizations and businesses rather than those that are based outside of Hawaii? I can maybe take a first swing at that one, Ani. Right now, we don't have, that, that's not built in to the current language of RSP. All developers are treated equally. But I think that's an important concept that's being raised because that's an important proposal that could come from communities or, or from, from um, local participants, organizations. You know, that's the kind of feedback that would help. I mean, how many electric cannot be the one to say, oh, we should, you know, that it, it should be this way. But if it were to come from community or, or organizations, that could very well be put before the Public Utilities Commission review. Um, and, and it's how, how we approach these, um, the selection process going forward. So that's the value, again, in having these important discussions. Got it. Thank you. So just to be absolutely clear, for example, you said earlier, the work that we did out on the, this west side, the community leaders on the west side put that 10-point letter into the PUC. I think nine of the 10 were approved. For the first time in Hawaii's history, community benefits are now a required part of the process. That's a game changer for us. You know, that, that has never been done before. Well, it's been done once. It was with a big project back mid-2000s for the last power plant that Hawaiian Electric built. But it points to the same way we get to these results, and that is community coming forward and saying, this is what we want for our Hawaii. This is what we think is best. And that goes directly to the PU. Well, the, the, the entity that oversees that process is the Public Utility Commission. So I encourage you folks, if this is what community is feeling and wanting, you folks are the actual people to help, that make, help make that happen. And all of this feedback is going into a report that will stand um, over time. Anything? So do we have another one? If I may, I, I saw one question and I didn't want to ignore it. Um, there was a question about um, how can communities be part of the selection process? Uh, we, we, that's a good question and that's something we don't have the answer to. But again, this can be a concept where we're willing to engage with communities and stakeholders and, and organizations on how, how, you know, how can we, how can we incorporate this right now? You know, what, what exactly, uh, you know, how best to capture community sentiment, you know, when, when, when proposing projects. There's not really like a defined model. We've been looking at other utilities, what, what mainland utilities are doing, and we haven't found exactly something that, that fits this, you know, in terms of uh, capturing community sentiment. But, you know, this is something that we're most open to, to talking about and through dialogue. We, we don't have the answer to a lot of these questions, I think, are good ones. And, we, we, you know, the only way we're going to find those answers is by having dialogue and talking stories and figuring things out together. So um, I'm sorry I don't have an immediate answer for you on that just yet, but I mean, that's something that's certainly worth spending time to talk about. Uh, Kurt, I'm going to backstop that, that question with the deeper question it, uh, that it poses is, who does make the selection of sites for projects now? So site selection is, is really dependent on the criteria that's set forth in the request for proposal. So to the extent that a project, a landowner, a developer come together and they can meet the, per, the criteria, the written criteria that's in the request for proposals, that is how projects get selected. Their ability to interconnect to the grid, to provide a reasonable cost per kilowatt hour, all of those important considerations are evaluated as part of that review process. 
and it's, bear with me because I think it's important for the general audience to know, then who selects that, who sets that criteria? So that's done through, um, you know, we've had a, a series of, of um, community meetings to help uh, w on these requests for proposals. You know, it was uh, input that we received from communities to participate in the design of the RFPs. And so that's a work in progress as well. We're, we're trying to get, uh, we'll work towards making that more of an inclusive process, and, and that's in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission. So that's something that, you know, we're, we're almost open to RFP design as well. So prior to these requests for proposals being issued, they go through a, a public comment period. And so that's where there's opportunity, like Alani said, that's when the West Oahu leaders submitted their, their comments and recommendations to that process, which led to improvements in, in the renewable energy development process. Thank you, thank you, Kurt. So we're coming close to the finish time. Comments, questions, concerns, we can go back to microgrid if, if there are any questions. Yes, sure. Final question, because I know this is the last of a series of workshops. Do you think you'll be doing another series, or just based on how this has gone? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I think for you know these workshops, it was centered around resilience through the the ETIP acronym that Ken mentioned. So just just to separate those two pieces. The ETIP process is really a snapshot at this point in time. We have the opportunity to partner with Katie and the National Renewable Energy Laboratories team to provide this, to create this map. And so that map is really the starting point for follow-up discussions as we take deeper dives into really getting into the weeds in terms of whether or not microgrids are a good fit for certain areas. So those conversations will absolutely continue. With respect to the re renewable energy zones analysis that Mark shared, that also is a very early analysis that was done. We wanted to share it with you as we are receiving it, as we're reviewing it. And so while it only captures solar and wind, as we get more information on other technologies that are mentioned, we absolutely want to share those as well. And so that's where um, that, uh, can, if we can show that, uh, that one screen on um, this new tool that we developed. Um, so this is on hawaiipower.com um, slash Oahu. This is that interactive tool that I mentioned. And the hope is that this would this would be an easier way to provide documented feedback. And they can get our, us as community members thinking about it too. But by visiting this site, you'll have kind of like a Google map type of image that will show up that will talk, uh, that will show this renewable energy zones analysis. And this is the one I mentioned, you can drop pins and, and have documented comments. We're gonna compile all of those and, and file them as part of this process, but it's not POW. It's, it's we're gonna continue talking about this concept on a going forward basis because as Ken and Mark mentioned, this is all part of long-term planning. And so as we're getting this input, we're also factoring that into how do we how do we improve and adjust our infrastructure, our transmission system to be able to connect more renewable energy projects to the grid? That's all part of the conversations that still need to be had with communities as we move forward. So lots more discussion to follow. Again, this is kind of the tip of the iceberg, but in, if there are interested uh, community organizations or groups that would be interested in sharing information with us, we absolutely would love to receive it. And this is just one, one vehicle for providing that feedback. Thank you very much. I think we're at a little bit past 8.32. You want to close up? Just, just a thank you and a mahalo from all of us at Hawaiian Electric. Thanks for spending your evening with us. Again, this uh, series of workshops that we had are just a snapshot in time. We want to continue having this com these conversations with you. Uh, the, inform the resource information that we shared here tonight is all available on hawaiipower.com. These meetings are all recorded, so if anybody's interested, you can watch them. Uh, thanks to the Olelo team for helping us to broadcast live, but they also give us a recording that we post publicly on our website. F and those same questions that people were asked in providing inputs on the Menti, those same questions are also available to be answered on the website as well. So this, we're gonna continue to document the inputs that are provided. And if it's easier, you can write us letters, you can send us an email to igp at huanelectric.com. Again, this is long range planning. There's no current project tied to this. This is just part of a process. So on a going forward basis, we welcome you to continue your conversations if you're willing to 
spend the time with us to have these conversations. Just, um, but in that, just wanted to thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you uh, joining us in person, online, and those who may be catching us after if you had commitments tonight. Uh, just a real big thank you to everybody who's participated throughout um, this process. It's been really helpful to us, and our hope is that we can continue to have these conversations to follow. Mahalo.